Good evening. Um, I'm so sorry Rumbachi could not come. <clears throat> so I'm here to waste your hour. <clears throat> um, first of all, um, I'm honored and happy to be here at the Buddhist Geek uh, Conference. And uh, when I was asked to be here for this conference, I was thinking, why did they invite me? <laughs> Do they think I'm a geek? <laughs> <laughs> or a nerd? Uh, <clears throat> socially awkward? So <laughs> I did some research about the word geek on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the part of the definition kind of fits me, you know. So anyway. Um, I feel quite sad that I have not been able to attend all the uh, lectures and uh, uh, group discussions. I would very much love to be uh, participating in those, but I had uh, pre-arranged uh, uh, events in the East Coast, which I couldn't escape. So I got in here this morning at 1 a.m., and so pretty much uh, from the airport to here, uh, with a little bit of a sleep. <clears throat> and so I'm really happy to be here and happy to see some of my old friends uh, here in LA. And uh, so monkey in mid swing, seeing through culture Staying in touch with wisdom, uh, that's my topic of discussion here. Um, one of the things that we, I heard at lunchtime actually, that I can't use the word we, so one of the things that have been actually very interesting is to look into the idea of uh, 21st century Buddhism and uh, technology. As we all are maybe aware that uh, Buddhism is uh, really difficult to explain. Isn't it? <laughs> if you think it's easy, please come up here. And, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to leave the party many times. Um, <clears throat> it's really difficult because uh, we all have different concepts about what is Buddhism, you know? Uh, many scholars say Buddhism is one of the oldest uh, world religion, one of, you know, not the oldest. And others, like myself, um, I feel that Buddhism is not really a religion, but is actually a genuine uh, science of mind and a genuine philosophy of a way of life. Right? That's how I understand it from my studies. I could be wrong, you know, because it's not that I've never made any mistakes in my life. I've made plenty. So I could be wrong here too uh, in understanding Buddhism. But I think that's what I understand and that's what I uh, hear from many leading Buddhist masters, such as His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And so, 
since Buddhism is really a genuine science of mind in which we explore the complexity and the, the function and the nature of our mind, it has so much to offer to any culture, any religion, and any community. You know, we all, I think, are, uh, one thing that we all can agree on, agree upon, is that we all experience some kind of mind, right? I hope. And so, since we have this thing called mind or mental experience, uh, it is also clear to all of uh, or many of us that a uh, lot of our suffering and happiness is based on this mental experience. And so, as we can see, that in the ancient world, the technology, so to speak, has been part of Buddhism throughout the centuries, right? It's nothing new in some sense. And we are kind of excited saying, you know, this new technology, you know, now we're embracing technology with Buddhism or Buddhism with technology, what have you. But actually, technology has been part of Buddhism for many centuries, right, for a long time. Like in ancient uh, China, in ancient India, in all these different countries where Buddhism has flourished, have incorporated technology such as uh, preserving the Buddhist scriptures, right, was one of the main uh, efforts that has been put into by many Buddhist countries. The first Buddhist canon, I think, uh, uh, put together, of course, we all know that it's Pali, in Pali language, and then we have the, the Chinese canon, and uh, Korean, and Tibetan uh, Buddhist canon. <laughs> and so I would like to talk a little bit about technology in relation to preserving the Buddhist teachings. Is that okay? And before we go into that detail, uh, as we can see from the history, um, Buddhism has spread from many, uh, sorry, from India originally to many different countries, like it has spread to Sri Lanka and to the Southeast Asian countries like Thailand, Burma, and so on. And then Buddhism has spread to the north of India, to like China and Tibet, and then to Japan and so on, in many countries. And uh, when Buddhism has traveled in all these different cultures and traditions, and history and psychology, different countries' psychology, it has taken different shapes, right, in each country, in each place. Like, for example, we have Tibetan Buddhism, which has its own culture, its own tradition, and then we have the Chinese Buddhism and Japanese and so on, right? But the, the teachings of the Buddha of course, the, the wisdom of the Buddha that we are trying to preserve here is beyond culture and beyond language. And so now the Buddhism is coming to the West and we're trying to bring that wisdom here and the culture and the tradition of this wisdom. And so that's why I have this uh, example that I use all the time, monkey, right, swinging from tree to tree. And that example is not something I came up with. It comes from ancient Indian text on a middle way. 
And so what does this example say is that uh, when the monkey swings from one branch to the next, you know? Have you seen monkeys swinging? I recently saw some monkeys uh, in Malaysia. I was in Malaysia two months ago, I think. And this monkey is trying to threaten me, uh, trying to scare me because <laughs> the monkey wants my backpack. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I was trying to do some Kung Fu. <laughs> uh, I don't know any Kung Fu uh, movements, like Kung Fu, to protect my bag. <laughs> my object of attachment. Uh, <laughs> protecting my ego. Anyway, you know, when the monkey is swing from one tree branch to the other, it is said in this ancient middle way text, uh, the skillful monkeys will not let go of the branch that they're holding right now. They have a good grip of this branch. They will not let go of that until it is sure that it's going to get a hold of the next branch that they're, you know, swinging to. Right? If you let go of the old branch that you have a good grip, before you get, you know, you're pretty sure about getting the next one, then you fall. Right? Then you fall in the middle. And in the same way, when this wisdom tradition is moving from one culture to the other, you know, when the Dharma tradition that we are talking about here to actually move into the 21st century, you know, there are some concerns like that, right? Uh, it is important for us not to let go of the branch that we are holding now uh, before we are really sure about the next thing, you see. And so therefore, <clears throat> um, digital, digital dharma is what I have been working on for many years. Uh, we have started this uh, organization called the Nitarta. Nitarta, which is a Sanskrit term, uh, which means uh, true meaning. Nitarta. Um, and we were, uh, we have been trying to preserve the Tibetan Buddhist texts into a digital format because the existing and the many Tibetan Buddhist teachings have been lost actually in the past, you know, 100 years or so with all the political and the social movements. We have lost many Buddhist, you know, very important uh, wisdom texts, traditions have been lost. I mean, their tradition practice has been lost along with the text. And so whatever is remaining, we're trying to preserve it. And so I've been trying to preserve these texts into a digital format uh, since 1993. And so we've been entering the texts into a digital uh, text, not just a scanning. We're inputting, actually, inputting all the text, which is a lot of work. Uh, not only the input part is difficult, but the, the real difficult part is the editing, to make sure the text is correctly input, and we have preserved the wisdom correctly. You know, so that's been quite a difficult. And so technology is playing an important role here in terms of preserving the Buddhist wisdom culture and the tradition. At the same time, uh, it is really changing our world of Dharma practice, not only the scriptures, but also the way we practice is changing because of the technology, right? For example, um, this week, you know, we had His Holiness, uh, the 17th Kamapa teach in New York City. And I was there uh, this week. He was teaching there, and uh, the actual audience in the theater was only like um, 
I don't remember. No, just kidding. Uh, it's like <laughs> 600, about like, you know, 700 people, okay? And the number of computers watching over the webcast, the right, number of computers like connected to the webcast was like over 3,000, you know? And each, uh, each computer that has connected to the webcast, uh, it's not necessarily just one person. There may be multiple people watching in each place. Sometimes we have centers watching, you know, with like, you know, 100 people or what have you, webcast teachings. And so we can see how the digital age is changing in terms of delivery of these teachings, in terms of practice of the Dharma, because we have online meditation courses I've seen many times. And is there any like an online refuge? Can you take refuge online? <laughs> have you seen that? No? <laughs> Uh -huh. Good idea. <laughs> That's an interesting thing to explore. Um, I've asked a number of, you know, really old Buddhist teachers. You know, I've, I've asked them, can we really present the, what do you call, uh, transmission, right? Transmission of these Buddhist uh, practices over the, uh, over these different medias you know, like over the uh, Skype or uh, a video, right? Like if, if some teaching has been given or the like a transmission has been given on, uh, recorded on video, can we use that as to receive the transmission for the students who were not there? I've asked this question. And one of the teachers gave me a really excellent answer. He said that it really is all up to the intention of the teacher when he or she is recording that teaching. He said if the teacher has the intention, put the intention in that, saying, okay, I'm recording this for transmitting, okay, transmitting the, the blessing or whatever of this teaching over the Skype or over the internet uh, a webcast or through the... Um, the video, then he said, that's you know, absolutely fine. And if the original intention is not for transmission, but only for the like, preservation of this teaching, of this one event, then he said it may not work as a transmission thing. So I think that's, uh, for me, it was a really wonderful thing to hear. Very clear, right? Very clear. Uh, as, we, as we all uh, may be aware that the Buddhist teachings always talk about intention, right? The primary thing is the intention. And so here it is, the intention of the teaching, a uh, teacher. And so, therefore, the digital age of technology is changing the way we are practicing Dharma, the changing the way we are actually studying the Dharma, and changing the way how we are interacting with each Sangha uh, communities, you know. It has uh, so many good qualities. At the same time, it is also very dangerous, I think, very dangerous age. Um, is that okay for me to criticize a little bit about technology? since I'm at the Geek Conference. <laughs> you know, there is this danger that uh, instead of technology that we have created to bring happiness to humanity, you know, if the technology is making us more suffering, then that's another problem here with the technology, right? Uh, the original purpose of creating all this technology is to bring happiness, to bring benefit to our human uh, society and also to all other sentient beings, so to speak, you know? 
I remember in the 80s when I was here in this country that uh, in America that you know people were so excited about the the notebooks and the laptops you know all these things computer technology saying that now you know everything is going to be much easier we will have much more time <laughs> look at where we are now right we actually have less time isn't it uh, and the horrible news is now the airplanes are offering Wi-Fi. <laughs> right? So our office can even track us down in the sky, like, right? And ask you some questions <laughs> that you may have to answer. <laughs> right? You may have to send some files or what have you. And so, actually, technology, like a computer that we had fantasy about doing our job and we will have more time because the computer will do a lot of the works that we have, uh, we have had to do before. It is true, computer is doing that, but it's not freeing us more, it's not giving us more time. In fact, it is giving us less time, isn't it? I realized one time I was sitting in my living room with some friends and I didn't, I didn't realize actually, I must tell you, uh, th this, oh. <laughs> Technology. Time machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see, Uh oh <laughs> I must tell you, you know, how, how, how much I was lacking mindfulness. You know, I didn't realize until like maybe 30, 40 minutes into that. We were all sitting in our living room, but after like 30, 40 minutes, I realized none of us are talking to each other. I was wondering, you know, what's happening? It's so quiet. We're not talking to each other. And we are all on our smartphones. You know, we're not talking. We are just doing something on your phone, smartphone. And then I was joking with them, say like, actually, we don't really need to talk because we can send text message to each other, right? Or uh, what do you call that? Uh, WhatsApp. <laughs> you know, you can send pictures to each other. And so you see. Uh, as more and more technology is developing, actually, sometimes there's a sense of uh, losing our human, you know, basic human connection, you know. I think that's the little bit dangerous part, in my view. People are getting very isolated in their smartphones and iPads and computers. And uh, one of my friends was really into this thing called the second life, right? Have you all tried that or no? I haven't tried it yet, but uh, my, my, one of my friends really into it, and I really am worried about uh, my, my friend, you know? <laughs> He's talking about all these things that, you know, I have no idea, you know? There's no, like, human interaction. It's all interaction in a computer, right? Digital. And sometimes I think there is a danger for us to lose the sense of uh, what we call the heart, the warmth of the heart, the heart connection. You know, technology is great, but if you lose the heart, then there's nothing much there, you know? There's nothing much there. Uh, I think that's really uh, problematic the, these days, you know? Like parents don't talk to kids because kids are on the smartphones, right? Or parents are on the, their Blackberries or what have you. Uh, I just don't want to promote Apple alone. <laughs> so I want to also talk about our Canadian, you know, Blackberry. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
<clears throat> you see, the parents on Blackberry, the fathers on Blackberry, the kids on some kind of smartphones, and moms on iPad. No one is talking to each other. You know, there's no warmth in that kind of environment. You know, like it's very affluent. It's a wonderful that we're using technology, but also we must save some time for this heart-to-heart -heart connection. You know, that's why I do enjoy preserving the Dharma in a digital format, but at the same time, I can't re get rid of my books. Really, I really feel there's some healing kind of power. You know, when you touch the paper, right, when you flip a page, and when you can smell this kind of, you know, paper, there's some magic there, you see? Which, you, which I don't feel from turning my page, page on the iPad. I don't feel the same, you know? It's, it's beautiful to read on iPad or, you know, uh, Amazon, so what do you call that, Kindle. It's really beautiful, it's wonderful, lightweight and everything, because I travel a lot, I need that, it's helpful. But there is no magic of the heart yet. And so if all the geeks they are in the world here, right? If we can put our efforts into this to bring some heart, bring some magic of the heart into our technology, I think that will be the day, you know, where we can say, this is it. You know, now we have everything here. There's, there's a heart there, heart connection, the warmth. At the same time, everything we can imagine from the technological side, you know. I love, as much as I love my books in an old format, at the same time, I need the digital text, you know. Because on, in a digital text, I can search, I can copy, right? I can email the text to my teacher so that he won't have any excuses for not answering my question, <laughs> saying I don't have the text in front of me, you know, see? Right? So that I can send the text to my friends, my students too, so that they won't have also the excuse to say, oh, I cannot study Dharma or practice, you know, it's right there in front of you, you see. Translators, it's a great tool for translators of all languages, right? Translating from Japanese, Chinese, Tibetan, you know, Pali, and so on. It's a great tool. So you see, these both are very important. The two very important elements here. And so therefore, um, if, if human, you know, I mean, there may be other beings listening here too, but I don't think they're using computers yet. Uh, if, if we as a human beca became a slave of technology, right, then there's a problem there. Then there's a problem. For that reason, we must remember why we are inventing these technologies, right? For what? Right? Not only keeping in mind the idea of uh, uh, the finances and so on, just, just to make money, but also we're creating these things to actually bring happiness, right? Joy, some sense of uh, freedom, I hope. And so therefore, it becomes important for us to pursue the, the path of uh, the development in technology uh, with some sense of a heart, right? With some sense of a heart. And uh, not to get totally isolated or lost in some very technical uh, development, you know?
we should try it, right? We should try this, and if we can succeed at the the first, uh, what is it? If you don't succeed, first, huh? Succeed, call it version version 1.0, <laughs> right? If at first we don't succeed in this pursuit, call it a version 1.0, you know? Uh, I just saw that joke on the internet. <laughs> I like humor. Um, when I was studying at Columbia University, um, you know, there are elective uh, courses, you know, and I was a little bit late to sign up, and so all the subjects I wanted to study, like psychology, you know, philosophy, business, whatever, you know, I don't remember, uh, are full, and so only two classes left, you know, were puns and humor. Puns and humor. <laughs> so I took this for a whole semester, you know, like... <laughs> so much suffering. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so, you know, therefore, we must try. You know, we must try, we must be innovative. Uh, we must have a vision of change uh, in terms of technology. And so we must bring this sense of a heart to marry with this uh, technological you know, development here. Um, and so, therefore, I feel that it is important for... Uh, anyone who's using the technology to actually, uh, from time to time, take a little break. You know, just take a little break. Even though we have these very strong impulses to open our iPhone and check the emails or something, how about not doing that for a few seconds, you know? Okay, impulse come. Okay, don't do it. And second impulse comes. Don't do it. And the third impulse comes. Don't do it. <laughs> right? Just wait. It will be just only like five minutes at the end when you look at the time. It's been five minutes you've been trying to refrain yourself from, you know, mindlessly engaging in these gadgets, you know. I think it's really nice to take a little break from our technology in our everyday life and have uh, take this you know time to breathe and connect with our heart you know and bring that heart experience of our heart connection to the technology when you go back it will be there naturally you know and so therefore I feel that um, digital Dharma is a very important learning Dharma from the digital technology, like the websites, you know. I'm really, uh, I'm really a strong fan of web and blog, and recently now I've been uh, hooked on uh, Twitter. <laughs> uh, I was forced to tweet at the beginning. <clears throat> um, but then I felt like, oh, it's actually interesting. You connect with so many people, you know, especially if you have some dharma to, to, to share or your experience of dharma to share. It's cool. And so I, I begin to like it. I begin to like it, but I don't find much time sometimes when I'm traveling. It's really a wonderful development here. Yet at the same time, there's a danger that there's so much information on the internet, you know, right? There's so, so much information. We are overloaded with the information. And it's hard to find the 
right information sometimes and it's hard to find a genuine uh, information that we are looking for and especially when we talk about dharmas sometimes it's hard to find a uh, how do you say i don't want to criticize anyone but uh, hard to find a a correct like translation for example find a correct translation right in this digital age you can post anything up there right you can translate yourself even if you don't know the language that well just put it up and someone reading it doesn't know you know uh, your knowledge of the language and you read and you think that's what this teaching say and then at the end you find out it's totally wrong or miss the point and so therefore there's also danger there in technology uh, and i don't i don't have any uh, solution and i'm not here to bring any solution to <laughs> so i'm just putting it out there so that you all can make your own um, best effort to uh, contribute in digital age digital dharma and how we can make it most beneficial for everyone and so i think um for that reason uh, when we are going into sometimes we go totally into like online right there's no real human connection like classes some classes just online uh i think it's okay for some degree uh, to some degree but on the other hand i think it's really important to have some human connection you see uh, i think that's really important so i'm not talking about universities but i'm talking about the dharma uh, when it talks about buddhism and dharma uh, or any kind of uh, uh, dharma traditions um hindu or buddhism or sufi or what have you i think it's good to go online it's good to have this opportunity yet at the same time to have some personal connection it's really uh, i think the key it's really the key to our practice of dharma and so therefore i don't think uh, we can get all the benefit of the dharma practice of the dharma study just through technology just through online but uh, we can use both right we can use both uh, we are so fortunate we live in this age that we have the opportunity to use both utilize these both uh, resources so if we can use both resources together some through online digital and some through personal uh, connection together i think it will bring a great benefit and so all in all uh, i think that it's important for us to see how we can make the the buddhist teachings right i i'm i'm a buddhist so <laughs> i'm speaking from that background how we can make the buddhist teachings more practical like how everyone can have the access to the teachings that they are interested in uh, to the wisdom that they are interested in to the practice that they are interested in and how we can bring the best uh, quality of dharma in this 21st century uh, from all traditions from asia uh, how we can bring it to the west how we can genuinely establish a western buddhist lineage you know which has already begun long time ago and now it is our duty our responsibility to perfect it you know it's like the one it's like what i was saying before that like you know version 1.0 right has already been there and now we must take it to version 2 and 3 and 4 however many it takes to perfect as much as we can 
and and uh, there are many uh, actually questions about uh, Western Buddhism. Uh, some people think that it is not possible, and some people think that we must preserve the Asian culture in terms of Buddhist practices and language, and some people think we should throw them away altogether. And so my approach here, or my understanding here, is like the monkey swinging from one tree branch to the next. You know, there's no real you know, answer to say, yes, we can throw everything away right now. Or there's no real answer saying, we should not throw anything, we should keep everything. You know, we must take this approach that, you know, we must move on uh, to the next tree branch, which is what we call Western Buddhism, or 21st century Dharma, in America, in Canada, in Europe, and Asia, where have you. We're moving towards that. And on the other hand, we're still carrying on some of the ancient cultural forms and traditions and hierarchy and so on, which we must transform gradually. And that transformation must start now. And so one day I hope we can have a genuine Western Buddhism and 21st century Buddhism and we all can enjoy the wisdom and the compassion of the Buddha's teachings and that we all can actually help each other benefit what we call all sentient beings, you know? So I always say that uh, the idea of benefiting all sentient beings is a joke. If you can't benefit the person sitting in front of you, you know? Uh, we have this big idea. I mean, actually, it's much easier to say, I want to benefit all sentient beings. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in some sense, it doesn't mean anything. All sentient beings. It's really a, just a nice word. But when you come to really benefiting or helping someone who really needs help, who is in front of you, then it's a challenging. Isn't it? It's not easy. It's not easy to even help one person. It's not easy to help one being, like, you know, cat. Uh, how can we think that we're going to be benefit all sentient beings when we just ignore the suffering of this being right next to you, you know? Uh, and so, therefore, I think Dharma has to be practical. You know, don't just be theoretical about compassion or love, universal love. Uh, but put it into practice. Uh, a lot of Americans are trying to look to give money to organizations that help third world countries, like poverty relief and so on. While we are totally ignoring the poverty that we have in America, right? There are many beings, you know, many people are suffering in America with poverty, not having not enough nutrition, not enough, uh, you know, support and so on. But we <laughs> we're trying to go, uh, try to help somewhere, you know, somewhere else, right? So why don't we start here? Uh, help beings that really need help right in your country, right in your city, uh, right in your neighborhood, uh, and then slowly expand that, you know? slowly expanded, then it's real practical. Then your compassion is real. Uh, you know, then your dharma practice is real. Then your, your vision for happiness for sentient being is real. You know, until then, I think whatever we chant, whatever we say, I think it is just a really nice gesture, but not really in action, you know. So it becomes a lip service. So therefore, let's uh, try whatever we can to bring benefit, you know, happiness and benefit to uh, people and to all uh, sentient beings as much as we can. 
Uh, I was hoping to do some question answers, but I guess uh, the time is pretty close. Maybe we can have one or two questions if you have. If not, uh, time is almost up. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, there are a lot of things like that. For example, environmental concerns, uh, ecological concerns, and so on. I think uh, from the Buddhist point of view, uh, you know, what we call interconnected, right? Interdependent. Everything is interconnected, interdependent. And so, you know, I was actually watching a program on TV about uh, the bees, you know. And when you, when you see that, it, it seems almost like, you know, the world is going to end if you don't have bees. Right? And if you watch the, the program about spiders, it's the same thing. Or the bats, or, you know, uh, rats, and so on. And I think all of them are true. Because we are all interconnected, you see. We're all helping each other, you know. We're all helping each other, and sometimes I think human beings, uh, as we, we all think we are pretty smart, uh, so we have been actually ignoring that, you know, ignoring that, and we have been very selfish, only concerned about my happiness, my joy, you know, like, oh, I'm too hot, let's turn up the air condition. We don't think about other, you know, impacts from that. Oh, it's too cold, let's, you know, turn up the heat. That's what I've been telling my friends in Asia, that in America, you know, we have very interesting suffering. That in the summer, we have to carry blankets when you go inside a house, <laughs> you know, because the air condition is too strong. And in the winter, we have to carry shorts because it's so hot. In any way, because the heat is so high. You know, it's all just wasted, you know. We can go in a like you know really middle way, right? Not too high air condition, not too high heating, and we, we all will be very comfortable with whatever we are wearing, <laughs> right? And so therefore, you know, you see the interconnectedness is very clear and very strong. Um, we all depend on each other, and so we must respect each other, and we must see how we can develop uh, technology in a way that is ecological, environmentally friendly, and so on, if that's possible. I think that's really uh, the important thing. So thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for uh, listening to my blah, blah, blahs. <laughs> and I feel that, uh, you know, all all the previous uh, wonderful teachers and uh, speakers have all <clears throat> already said everything that needs to be said. And I'm here to um, I should have said that actually at the beginning. I don't need to say much because it's already said for the last few days. And so I think I'm here to really um, present uh, whatever I feel from my heart in terms of uh, technology uh, and Buddhism, 21st century Buddhism. And we really have to balance between the heart connection and the technological development. That's my feeling. And uh, also, I would like to thank uh, all of you for being here, and especially for the organizers, the Buddhist geeks, 
Uh, I think Buddhist geeks have been uh, really instrumental in 21st century dharma uh, for the last, uh, I think it's almost five years now, isn't it? Buddhist geeks have been five years now, is it? Almost, huh? Yeah, almost five years. And I've been to their studio in Boulder and so on. It's really wonderful. Uh, I've listened to some of your podcasts and thank you so much for your wonderful work and bringing Dharma uh, really into the 21st century. We need more. We need more of these. And so thanks for your wonderful work and thanks everyone for your participation in this effort. And I hope uh, uh, that I haven't wasted your hour here this evening. And uh, hope to see you all soon somewhere in the future. And thank you very much.